you for that, Petra. I did start as a model. I was an editorial as well as campaign model. So I did fashion weeks. I did campaigns. I was placed in all the top fashion capitals in the world with top agencies. So I had that experience from a young age. I started modeling when I was about 16. And from there, I was still being educated as well. I never took a break from school. I was going through university at the same time. And I'm very thankful to my parents that they instilled that in me and didn't let me take a gap year or anything like that. They said, you're going to stay in school. And I did. And I was very relieved because quickly went with my first placement in Milan when I was 19 and living abroad. I was a bit older than some of the other girls there. And I was happy for that because I was a lot more protected and I just had a bit more of a world view at that age. And it quickly became clear to me that I didn't want to do this as a career. I saw it as more of a side thing to provide me money to put myself through school and uh, have some very interesting experiences and meet people, but it wasn't a long, a career with longevity at, at all. And I had a lot of friends tell me some very terrifying stories in the industry. So from there, once I finished my undergraduate, I went on to study at the University of the Arts in London, which I'll just bring up my presentation now. Um, so we can see that. And while I was there, I completed my master's in applied psychology and fashion. And while studying there, I worked for the largest model management company in Europe, which was interesting. And just being on the other side of it after modeling myself. And I was very lucky to have that experience and learn from some of the giants in the industry. And I worked for a very reputable agency. They treated their models very well, but unfortunately, a lot of people have very negative experiences in this industry, and I really wanted to understand why and study that through an academic lens, because I think it's it's an overlooked area. There's not much research in it, because very few educators have come through the world of modeling, obviously. like Very few models become academics, basically. So I think I have a very interesting point of view in that case, and I found a lot of passion and rigor to want to study this because of my perspective, and I felt like I was doing justice to some of the stories that I had heard coming through it myself. So um, with that, I'll probably get started, <laughs> but that's kind of an introduction on me, and now I work in the fashion industry for a large uh, Canadian fashion retailer, but I I definitely have, um, I'm very passionate about sustainability as well, but this is where my research took me. So I actually turned my dissertation into an article and that's what I'm presenting today is the article that came out of my dissertation through my master's. So I published it with two other authors, Amira Kadaru and Aurora, Aurora Bardi. Aurora was my professor at school and Amira was my supervisor. Perfect. So like I said, it was based on these findings and my paper is already published at TF Online through Fashion Practice. So just a quick rundown of events, very typical. We'll just go through kind of the article, through abstract, research questions, literature review, methods, key findings, and conclusion. I'm going to skip through the professional background because I went over it quite quickly. But uh, yes, this is what I accomplished while I was a model. And now I've spent five years in the corporate side of fashion and having both of those experiences has been great because it's developed me personally and professionally. And I definitely want to stay in the academic realm and possibly do a PhD in the future. I'm very passionate about this topic and about this area. And like I said, I think it needs to be more developed from a certain perspective. Uh, so why I chose this topic, I think it's it's pretty plain to see why I chose it, but it was from my personal background, I was very passionate about it, like I'm saying, and it was a necessary area to develop. I saw discrepancies in the industry and a gap in understanding. And this career also affects many young people. And I think that's a very interesting point of why this is so important is because it affects specifically young women at such a young age in their, in their development. And that is why we need to be taking it very seriously and obviously wanted to change it for this next generation. Uh, so just going to run through my abstract. Uh, so fashion models are often assumed to have a very glamorous job with limited consideration for their well-being. Results show a significant gap in understanding of model well-being between industry professionals and models themselves. Uh, there is an inherent need for change, 
that exists in the modeling industry to promote and enhance model well-being through regulation, culpability, and education. Uh, culpability meaning more to do with the agency model relationship and education meaning just social awareness in general and regulation meaning policy and change making. Uh, two of my research questions that guided this body of research were one, how do the perspectives of fashion models and professional industry experts compare on the topic of well-being of models? So that gap in understanding. And the second one was, what is the experience of being a fashion model and to what extent does this influence their well-being? So again, the experience of the models themselves versus how industry professionals perceive model well-being and how they speak about it and what actions they take. Uh, so just a quick rundown of literature review. Like I said, the area is quite scant in terms of what's already pre-existing, but I wanted to call out a few papers that really built the foundation for this paper to be possible. Um, very interestingly, this Sadomsky paper, she wrote it as a final in her law exam, and it was actually talking about the independent contractor loophole that models fall into, specifically in New York, but this is a global issue, is that models are signed to agencies, but they're still independent contractors. So again, that accountability stage doesn't come in, especially even at a young age. They sign contracts. They're really employed by the agency, but they're not. They sign waivers. Uh, they're not paid at, on a timely basis. And these are all issues to do with the independent contractor loophole. She, so she explored this in this paper, and that was a very instrumental that I used in my research. So I wanted to give her a shout out for sure. Um, there's other papers I had to pull on different areas of research because, again, the area isn't very well developed. So one of them was body size on women's body focused anxieties. Models have a very high drive for thinness. So that's something that Holly Wayne Dittmore explored there. And body image concerns in professional fashion models, are they an at-risk group? This is by Swami. That was a very interesting paper talking about if they are in the sense that there was a lot of a, a large body of research that people were exploring in the early 2000s, whether all models are anorexic, and a lot of papers really just focused on eating disorders and models, which is absolutely an important topic to focus on, and it does feed into well-being, of course, but it's a very niche topic that doesn't apply to overall well-being. And then there's some other papers here on this next slide to do with like happiness and despair on the catwalk by Meyer, Onstrom, Harvstedt, Bowles, and Beavers. That was very interesting, but it was a quantitative approach, mainly sending out a survey and having models reply to it. But it's it's a great way to get a sense of one particular well-being pillar. But again, that overall well-being isn't really being explored and not in depth. It's just from a survey, so a quantitative point of view. Then there was a phenomenological study that was interesting, but again, it wasn't the same depth of it. Um, this book by Victoire, that was a very interesting book, kind of, again, from a model's perspective and anecdotal information of what she experienced in the industry. That was very inspiring to me before I did my master's. Uh, but again, this is an academic body of research. And another one was self-deterministic theory that facilitates intrinsic motivation, social development, and well-being. This was truly fascinating because Models are such an interesting, it's such an interesting career track that very few people understand that are outside of it, uh, especially that's what my paper explored, even people that work with them every day, uh, industry professionals such as model directors, uh, agencies, bookers, photographers, stylists, hairstylists, they still don't really fully understand what a model goes through and how that affects well-being. So with Ryan and Dusty's paper specifically, they talked about how motivation and social development affect well-being and why this fed into models is because models can actually be very uh, lonesome at times because they're living in cities abroad away from their families. And this affects their social development because of the loneliness will affect their well-being. And in terms of intrinsic motivation, you are constantly really relying on your agency to provide you money that you're waiting for. And it's this constant state of dependence, which undercuts motivation. And as well, you want to do well, but you don't know how to. And that also uh, increases the drive for thinness because there's many things out of your control as a model. You don't know where you're going to be the next month. 
you know, where you're going to be the next week. You don't know when your next paycheck's coming. You don't know when your next job is coming. So you really focus on the things you can control. And a lot of that has to do with aesthetics and to do with weight specifically. So that's a huge reason why also the eating disorders are very prevalent. I believe it because it's something that is a controllable force in a very uncontrollable life, if that makes sense. Uh, so all of those reasons and more is why I decided to do a qualitative study. I wanted to do a mixed methods at the beginning, but it felt that the area was too underdeveloped to do that properly and at the scope that I wanted it to, the depth and breadth. So I stuck with qualitative and I really wanted to build that foundation so others could study this area and possibly use my paper to kind of reference that to build on top of it and do a mixed methods in the future. Um, so the way I went about this is I designed two semi-structured interview schedules, one for each group. So one for models, one for industry professionals. They were 15 open-ended self-designed questions in line with past literature that I just explored with you on fashion models and well-being. Uh, the questions were designed to explore the experience of modeling, well-being in models, and how industry professionals, again, perceive the effects of modeling and that gap in understanding. Uh, Braun and Clark, those steps were followed, the six steps uh, for a thematic analysis, and it was in code using Vivo. Everything was anonymized. I, found, I thought that was very important. There was a lot of talks about whether it should be or not, but I really wanted to protect the models as well as the industry professionals that felt comfortable to talk to me. A uh, typical interview with models lasted about an hour, some of them going all the way to two hours, which was pretty intense. There was quite a large, there was definitely a saturation level and 25 minutes was typical for uh, industry professional talk. And then this table below that you see is just a breakdown of the participants. Um, as you'll see there, all of the models are female, but there's a mix in terms of the professionals and their gender and the years of experience working in the modeling industry or the age they started modeling and then the job title for professionals. Uh, but again, everything else was anonymized. This is just a breakdown tree of the key findings. It's a lot easier to visualize this way. So there were two main themes that I kept for the article. There were three to come out of the dissertation, but this is what ended up staying. So the two main were the model's well-being and the work perception gap between models and professionals, and then six subcategories. Four under model well-being was happiness, resilience, anxiety, self-esteem. And under work perception gap, it was experience as a fashion model and the illusion of glamour. So I'll just go on to go more in depth into each of them. Uh, so to start off under the work perception gap, experience as a fashion model. So all models in the sample shared accounts of abuse, sexual objectification, and or extreme pressure from the industry to remain thin. That was the probably the most shocking result of the entire exploration, even though this is what you expect when you actually hear it firsthand from people um, explaining different terrifying stories. It was it was really sad to see, but I, I hope that exploring it and bringing it to light and educating more about it, that hopefully it can change for future generations. Um, but all models stated that they wanted body sizes to be changed to healthier ones, so the pressure to engage in disordered eating would be alleviated. So direct quotes um, from participants will be riddled through this. So one of them is, if the sample size is changed, then we will change. So in the sense of rather than a sample being a zero or a two, if they were a UK eight, even that would really alleviate some of the stress to remain so thin. Conversely, the majority of professionals thought models experienced rejection and nothing more um, in the sense of a detriment to well-being. So that clearly shows that there's a huge gap in understanding between what the models are experiencing and what the industry professionals are perceiving. Uh, so moving on to the illusion of glamour. So both groups of participants believed that the fashion modeling industry was incorrectly glamorized by the general public, creating unrealistic portrayal of this industry and also perpetuating this image that you should go into it. It's still a very illustrious career. You still meet so many young girls and young women that want to be involved in fashion in some capacity. And I think that is really the dangerous act because even when um, a young girl is scouted on the street, it's very hard for parents to educate themselves on how or, or why rather their, 
their child should go into this industry or not. It's very hard because there's very lack of information on the internet or even in academic studies. So it's difficult when a parent goes on and tries to educate themselves of, okay, should I let my child go to this? Should I let my child move away from me? Should I trust this agency? It's very hard to find that information. And what you typically end up doing is they go to the agencies and they have interviews with them to discuss, okay, what should my child's future be? And then you just need to take that at face value because there's no other way of getting that information. There's no consultants in the industry. They sometimes ask their friends. They ask other people, okay, have you had a good experience at this agency? There's no Yelp for model agencies. Like it just doesn't really exist. And that's a huge issue, I think, because even thinking of becoming a parent in the future myself, I know that I, I, may not let my daughter go into modeling for a multitude of reasons, but other parents don't have that background knowledge. So it's another reason why I really believe in educating in this area and bringing awareness to it. Um, Yeah, with that, um, this is just a a direct quote from one of the model participants. The general public thinks it's a very glamorous job, something that only perfect people can do, but the industry itself is more callous. That's pretty, that says it very well. Uh, And all six models and three industry professionals also presented the reality that modeling is a short career and models are seen as disposable. Uh, Direct quote from one of the model agency directors, we are in the business of selling dreams. So just even that alone is quite jarring to hear that they're aware of what they're selling, like of exactly what it says, like of this dream and this perception of what it could be, how exciting your life could be, but that real the reality of that is that a lot of people end up leaving school for modeling and they don't really have a backup plan to get out of it so you kind of get stuck in in this and you've been told that it's all going to be okay but really no one's there to to help you out of it afterwards there's no succession plan and in terms of like talking about like a, a future and kind of like a future plan and how to set yourself up for success no one really helps you through that Um, And that is something I brought up in in the interviews and all of the industry professionals denied that, that modeling has a direct relationship with school and a negative one. But um, it's unfortunately that just isn't, it's just not the truth because a lot of people do end up uh, leaving other opportunities aside and focusing on modeling. And then it's a very short career and afterwards it's very difficult for you to like get into something else. Uh, so just moving on to models well-being and the, these four subcategories, uh, all model participants identified vocational success to have a positive influence on their happiness. For instance, one participant saw herself on a billboard and she was absolutely incandescently happy. However, all models also referenced the impact of agency feedback and lost castings as having devastating, crushing, and miserable effects on their happiness. Five of the six per- Five of the six professionals admitted to observing models struggling in their careers and how this often harmed their emotional well-being. Five of the six models were told by their agency to lose weight and described how this had a direct negative impact on their happiness and well-being. Uh, Direct quote, I was told to lose weight within a certain amount of time for a contract, which I think I lost most of it, but not all of it like my agency wanted. But in that period of my life, I was the most neurotic, like the most upset that I had probably ever been in my whole life. So again, this shows that there are there are dips in well-being and happiness. And something the industry professional stated is that this happens in every industry and this happens in every career track. And I absolutely agree with that. But this level of it at such a young age in their development, again, because when you look back at the chart, most of these most girls are scouted between the ages of 13 and 14 and they start actively modeling at age 16 or 15. That's very young in the development stage. So that's this terrifying part is having those highs and lows at that stage when you haven't really built up that resilience or that emotional bandwidth at the older age. Um, The other scary part is a lack of intervention here is that the industry professionals never stated to of how they helped them get out of that rut. It was mainly just talking about, we observed this and then there was no, there was no intervention again. There was no, um, there was no action taken. Uh, so the next something being resilience, all participants from both groups stated that a thick skin was necessary to survive this cutthroat industry, but perceived the effects of this constant rejection differently. 
Past research suggests that the need to develop resilient qualities could also be an indication of poor well-being by Hunter and Chandler in 1999. People are a bit divided on resiliency. It's actually a very interesting topic that you could that you could absolutely write a, a full PhD paper on, and, and many people have, because some people believe are in this camp of believing that you build up resilience in a thick skin from poor well-being because you've been through detrimental experiences and built that up. And other people believe that it's a necessary evil of life and that we need resilience to be able to uh, develop emotionally and be able to withstand difficult circumstances in life. Um, so it's really divided, but I wanted to explore it and also just note to uh, the research that exists today. So all the models commented on the lasting emotional and psychological effects rejection has on their well-being. All of the rejection that comes with modeling, you get used to it, but then you never really realize how much it affects you. While five of the six professionals agree that rejection was painful to endure, they also believe that models were equipped to handle this. It is what it is. That's the industry. So again, not really a lack of understanding. I, I think this is actually where the industry professionals understood the most. But again, there's no lack of intervention. It's really, it is that callousness of we understand it, but it's not really our problem. This is just how it is. And no no need to improve it at all or no talks about how to. So that's really the concerning part. All models attested feelings of anxiety surrounding their body image and commented on the uncertainty present for them in the industry, the waiting, the not knowing, and how this can lead to feelings of anxiety. Swami and Smilgalska reported that modeling could trigger image obsession and a higher drive for thinness, like we talked about previously. Modeling has made me feel super anxious, I would say honestly, all the time, to the point where it's like debilitating anxiety. Another gap in understanding is indicated here because extreme physical expectations and consistent pressure to lose weight can cause harm to a model's well-being. And yet the industry professionals didn't fully understand that that this can cause such high levels of anxiety. They believe that it is present, but they're not concerned about it. So finally, just self-esteem. So self-esteem was raised in the short term, but lowered in the long term, which I found quite interesting because the industry professionals believed that it would really boost self-esteem. And that is true, but in the long term, it actually really leaves you with these detrimental effects. And that is what's so fascinating about the psychological well-being of modeling and, and how it does affect these um, these girls and people in general about long term and how they leave the industry um, better or worse off. Um, so while all models agree that modeling has boosted their self-esteem initially, ongoing modeling was described as having detrimental effects on their self-esteem, identity, and body image. So reported by the models themselves, five of the six models stated that the pressure to lose weight for modeling was detrimental. It led to feelings of inadequacy, eating disorders, lowered their self-esteem and affected their body image negatively. Uh, so one direct quote, within the industry, there's a lot of self-esteem issues. I would say specifically just like body weight. Constantly just hearing comments, I base my worth on my weight all the time. I don't like the feeling of being full. It makes me feel like I'm not doing something right. It's really deeply psychological. Uh, so just extended on self-esteem, the constant rejection and pressure to self-objectify and scrutinize one's own body image was shown to dramatically lower self-esteem in all six model participants. Because again, it's I believe that it is this desire to control the one thing that you can control within this industry and within this career track. So as stated by Zneslek, low self-esteem and depression can exacerbate the effects of rejection. So objectification theory was also something I explored within the theme of self-esteem by Fredrickson Roberts, with an emphasis on the internalization of the observer's perspective, example, the agency and the bookers in the study, as the main lens through which one's physical self is evaluated, this can lead to regular body monitoring, causing increased anxiety, body shaming, and mental health issues, including eating disorders. Um, yeah, so just explain the contract loophole like we talked about, and just that we really need to take action, that pledges aren't enough, because that's what it has existing now. And obviously, this power dynamic between model and agent needs to be re-examined.